welcome everyone on this warm, balmy desert April afternoon. Our discussion today will be Women's Guide to Healthy Aging. I'm a nurse practitioner. I've been a nurse for 30 years and a nurse practitioner for 22 of those 30 years. I started out as an ICU nurse and I was a primary care nurse in uh, primary care in Palm Springs. Then I was in cardiology. Then I was in a con uh, concierge of 365 practice here at Eisenhower. I've been with Eisenhower for 10 years. And then I was in gynecology for quite some time. And now I do high resolution anoscopy, but women is my passion. And I really like to live a healthy lifestyle. So healthy aging is really a passion of mine. So I'm delighted to be here with you all. So let's get started. What has changed in women's health since the 1920s? Remember the roaring 20s? It was a great time for fashion, but women didn't live very long. So longevity has increased. Look at this really odd, inspiring jaw dropping life expectancy chart. Life expectancy has increased by 30 years since the early 1900s, 1920s for men and women. But look at this, here we are at 2020, look how far we've increased. So what's helping us live longer and how can we live longer and age gracefully along the way and continued greater healthy living? Well, women are living longer because we're doing things like going to great medical facilities like Eisenhower Health and we're having screening tests. And along the way, before these tests were invented, screening guidelines were produced as to the reason why we need to have screening tests. Why do we do screening tests? To screen for anything that could be abnormal. So having an annual well woman exam is crucial all women of all ages should have a well woman exam every year annual well woman exam tattoo that somewhere or needle point it on a pillow it's crucial what's involved with an annual well woman exam well depending on your risk factors and where you're at you may need to have a pap smear mammograms are really recommended from the age 40 through your years even into your 80s and 90s, if you want quality of life, because if an early breast cancer is caught, even in an elderly woman, it can be treated easily and not lead to other causations and so forth. So you really want to have that annual mammogram, blood test, depending on your risk factors, cardiac tests. Uh, Candace and other friends and I, we all talk about how important it is to remember that women's cardiac health and women's risk factors for cardiac disease is equal to men. We think cardiac, heart disease, heart attacks, strokes, oh, men get that. No, women are afflicted equally. There's also a greater emphasis on health in general since the 1920s, thriving, just not surviving, increased access to healthcare that's becoming more and more and more in the modern era scientific advances in healthcare. Every six months, there's a new dramatic advancement, right? Focus on prevention. You know, it was all about survival. Now we can focus on preventing disease. So that's where this healthy aging is coming along. We can live a very vibrant, robust life in our 70s and 80s and so forth. And then the emphasis and importance on a healthy lifestyle, it's the trend, it's exercise, eating right, all of that makes a big difference. So what are the recommended health screenings for women? Like I said, a full physical yearly, like your, as well as your well woman exam. So you need to see your primary doctor for a physical exam every year. And you need to see if your primary doctor doesn't do women's health along with primary care, then you may need to see a, a women's health specialist, a gynecologist and have your well woman exam, which would be a pelvic exam and a breast exam every year. And then depending on your risk factors, pap smears, um, cervical pap smear every one to three years starting at age 21, then it's individual per woman's history. And interestingly enough, if you have certain risk factors or HPV and you're over the age of 50 and you have a history of abnormal pap smears, anal paps are now becoming a new screening test that's not, hasn't been in the mainstream, but we're trying to bring it there so we can screen for anal rectal 
lesions as well. Mammogram every year starting at age 40. Colonoscopy, I think it used to be 50. I need to change the slide. I believe they moved it to age 45. So they've moved colonoscopy up from age 50 for everyone to age 45 for everyone. And it can be earlier for other individuals that have family history and other risk factors. There's also, you know, alternatives, Cologuard and other testing, but really colonoscopy is the gold standard and it's moved to age 45. Laboratory, uh, lab testing, you need to have your blood work done once a year. That's very important. Bone density only after the age of menopause for women every one to three years. So how often do women need to have a gynecological exam? I get this all the time. Women that have hysterectomies are told they never need to go see the gynecologist again or have to have a pelvic exam. I hear all of these different scenarios. The truth is it's a body part. So if you've had a hysterectomy or not, you should still have a pelvic exam at least every couple of years because that part of your body needs to be examined. So after the age of 65, you have no risk factors. You could go every two years, but I recommend, you know, that you have an annual physical exam by your primary care provider. And then depending on your risk factors, it's just a good idea to examine that part of your body at least every 12 to 24 months. So that's why there's a lot of confusion and bewilderment out there. When, what, ask your doctor, go in, see them, when in doubt, check. It doesn't hurt to check. What is the difference between a pelvic exam and a pap smear? Great question. So some women don't need to have a pap smear, but every three years, or if they've had a hysterectomy for a benign reason, they don't need to have a pap smear. Some women, because of certain risk factors, need to have a pap smear every year, but every woman should have a pelvic exam. And the pelvic exam terminology is just exam examination of the pelvic region, which includes examination inside the vagina, also should include a rectal exam, and just anywhere from the belly button down in that region, that's a pelvic exam. The pap smear is the actual test that's done during a pelvic exam. Like I said, a pelvic exam is an anatomical exam and a pap smear is a lab test. This is just a little pelvic exam anatomical example of what we do during a pelvic exam. You'll have a speculum place that just kind of opens the tissue so the practitioner can see inside a little better. Swabs are placed to collect tests for pap smear and if there's other testing done. Also, they palpate the pelvic region to palpate your bladder, your uterus, your ovaries. And then lastly, every woman should have a rectal exam after the age of 50 with her pelvic exam. This is some of the equipment that we use for the pap smear testing that may or may not be done during the pelvic exam. So just information. And then if you do have a pap smear, that specimen is sent to a lab. A lab a specialist takes a look at the cells underneath a microscope and sends the results to your doctor, your provider, and that's your pap smear results. So wait, what's a pap test? What's a pap smear test? Men can have pap smears, right? Pap of the anus. Women can have a pap smear of the cervix, the vagina if the cervix isn't there, and the anus. So there's some different types of pap smears. It's your provider will know which you need by your history. So if you have an abnormal pap smear result that has abnormal cells and or is positive for HPV, human papillovirus, then there are other steps and closer monitoring to be done if those results show up. This is another example, kind of a closer picture of how we collect cells from the cervix. We go inside with a cyto brush and we also scrape the outside. They used to call it kind of a scraping, it's kind of a crude term, but it you can feel that a little bit when you have the test done, but it's very important to get a good amount of cells. So there is some scraping of tissue involved. So what is cervical cancer screening? That's what the whole idea of a cervical pap smear is, is a screen for cervical cancer, which we now know is linked to the STD, sexually transmitted disease or STI, sexually transmitted infection, HPV, 
human papillovirus. This is a nasty virus. Have we all heard of viruses? Oh, yep, they run the world, right? It seems like it. But let's empower ourselves and be proactive by having a cervical pap smear. And if your indications are for anal pap smears, it's proactive information. Every time a patient has a, a test, it is knowledge and knowledge is power. And in this case, having pap smears and other tests is really empowering you to, to be proactive and live a healthy longer life because you're having testing done, which where you can find ailments earlier, get treatment and live a longer, healthier life. So cervical screening is used to find cells in the cervix that could lead to cancer. And cervical cancer, we now know, is from HPV, which can also cause head and neck cancer, some esophageal cancers, and anal rectal, as well, as well as cervical, vaginal, and vulvar cancers. So cervical cancer is slow growing. That's why it takes three to seven years to be picked up, and it's important that's why women. So I'm belaboring this point of having women, what's an answer to healthy aging? It's having all of these, this testing done, especially pap smears, if it's indicated, because we can catch these cancers very, very early. The technology is such, not like in the 1920s when these tests didn't exist, we can catch all of this early. So this is just an algorithm of certain women at their certain age groups of when they should have and how often they should have that uh, pap smear testing. And there's different guidelines from different groups. This is from the American College of Gynecology. There's also guidelines from gastroenterology on when you should have colonoscopies and so forth. And this is more information regarding that. This is also another algorithm regarding HPV. When can women stop, have, stop having pelvic exams? Once again, if you've had a hysterectomy for a benign reason, you can usually stop at a certain age. If you've had hysterectomy because you had cancer, then that's a different answer and your provider will know that. What about breast screening and mammograms? Every woman should have a breast, clinical breast exam by a clinical provider once a year. That's your primary care or your women health, women's health provider. It's important once a year. I agree with mammograms every year after the age of 40. Breast cancer survival is directly related to the size of cancer at time of diagnosis. The smaller the cancer, the better the outcome. The goal of screening is to find cancer at as early as possible stage. I've had women that I found when I was in women's health, breast cancer, they were in advanced age, but I found a very small breast cancer, which was very treatable. And they went on to live many years, even though they were already in advanced age. So it's crucial to have mammogram. And right now it's better than ever because we have the best technology for breast health. Here at Eisenhower, we have the 3D mammogram, which is spectacular and helps women live longer because we can find abnorm abnormal results and small cancers much earlier. So all women are at risk for breast cancer. 75% of diagnosed patients will not have any family history. If you have a family history, your risk is three to four times higher. If you have the BRCA gene in your family, and it, which is an inherited genetic mutation, you have a higher percentage rate as well. So know your family history. That's another part about healthy aging. If you're able to find out your family history, it's beneficial to you. Now we have all this genetic testing, which can also be beneficial because information is power. Knowledge is power information about our medical history and our current medical status is very empowering. These are national guidelines regarding mammogram, screening and prevention guideline. There are some that are at higher risk and may need to start mammograms earlier and or have them more frequently. This is also another algorithm regarding breast health. 
we have this new mammogram technology. It's not really not that new, but a lot of centers don't have the high-tech mammogram that we do here at Eisenhower Health. There used to be the conventional digital mammogram, but now we have what's called tomosynthesis. And breast tomosynthesis or breast tomo takes, a, takes multiple images of the entire breast and creates a 3D image of the breast, making small cancers much easier to see and be detected even in dense breast tissue, which a lot of women have breast tissue that's very dense. So here we offer this specific mammogram, this 3D mammogram, you may hear it called 3D or Mamotomo. It's fantastic and I highly recommend if you do have a mammogram that you have a 3D mammogram. In this example, you can see where the red circle is on the traditional mammogram, it's left on my screen, and it's barely visible, but on the right, it really sticks out. And that's the difference between a traditional digital mammogram and a 3D tomosynthesis mammogram. What about hormone replacement therapy? I put a picture here of all kinds of different shoes because hormone replacement therapy is very individual and it's different for each woman, depending on her risk factors, family history, symptoms, and what her goal is for what she would like to achieve. Some women choose not to have hormone replacement therapy when they go through menopause, and that's absolutely fine as well. There's lots of options. You need to speak with your provider that knows you and your history. That's the benefit of having a primary care provider and a well woman provider that knows you and your history well, so they can discuss and find with you what's the best therapy. So moving on to heart health. As I mentioned earlier, I used to be the American Heart Association Go Red for Women chair. And that was a really delightful role. It was a volunteer role here when I was uh, already here at Eisenhower. I was involved very heavily with American Heart Association. And the main take home point of all of that effort and energy behind American Heart Association Go Red for Women is to educate women that heart disease afflicts women equally as, as it does men. So eating healthy and exercise sounds basic, but it's something that can really make a difference with healthy aging. Eating healthy, we have this wonderful sunshine and exercise we can get, but we need to couple that with kind of a, a lifestyle. It's not a diet. It's not uh, a, you know, a trend, even though the trend around the world certainly is living longer and living healthy. I think that in the news the other day, the oldest living person, which was a woman living in Japan, she was 119. And I think she just died a couple of days ago. I heard this on the news. And you know, this is, I mean, that was so inspirational. It's possible that women and men, all of us can live much longer if we pay attention to eating healthy and exercise. What's eating healthy? Well, certainly eating lots of fruits and vegetables, right? Foods with low glycemic index, foods that are lean, eating whole foods, right? Anything out of a box, a can or a bag, is likely a food that's been processed. So eating foods that are not processed and getting exercise daily. The American Heart Association said to stay and maintain your condition, you should exercise most days, which is what, five, six days a week, if not all, 30 minutes a day. And that can just be walking. And that's just to maintain. If you're interested in getting leaner or losing a few pounds, that may be more, but you would need to speak with your provider about what types of exercise are safe for you. Once you get that clearance, then I'm all for exercise, as long as you have the tolerance and you do it safely. So here are some guidelines regarding healthy maintenance. It's 30 minutes, five days a week, just for maintenance. For weight loss, it's 60 to 90 minutes, most days of the week. For heart disease, at least three days a week. We should all should be moving as much as possible. You know, park your car further in the store so you walk from the store to the parking lot, all of these things, getting step counters, anything you can do to move more, eat lean and eat whole. 
healthy aging. I also heard uh, some very interesting news regarding wrinkles, right? We're all trying to look more youthful. And there's a study that shows eating processed foods or fried foods have a lot of free radicals in them and they can affect the skin. Where you eat something such as blueberries or a green salad that has all of these antioxidants, it actually reduces free radicals and can reduce wrinkles. So not only does it help with your interior, your heart health and exercise, it also can reduce wrinkles, who knew? So wrapping it up, what can women do to be healthier, have healthy aging? Also, there's mental involved in that too. So make sure you're doing a whole health check when you see your primary care provider every year, talking to them not only about your physical health, but your mental health, seeing if you have you know, any issues coming up, make sure you're referred to a therapist or mental health specialist if any issues are going on there because we, really anything that affects one part of the body affects the other part of the body, whole body health care. You wanna have an, an, your annual full physical by your primary care provider. And some primary care providers do a well woman exam as well, or you may have that separately done by a well woman provider, a gynecologist or a women health provider. So full physical every year, well woman exam, pelvic exam, breast exam, your providers will determine what your risk factors are and your, and your history regarding when you need to have a pap smear. And if you've started your mammograms, colonoscopy, annual blood work, all of that. Pap smear for women used to be um, at age 18 or earlier if they were sexually active. Now it's starting at age 21, which is fine. Um, and then from there forward, it's per the woman's individual health. Mammograms starting every year at 40. Colonoscopy now is at 45. Every 10 years after that, if it's normal, it may be sooner for some people that have family history of other risk factors, or it could be 10 years if everything is normal. Labs, you wanna have your blood work done and bone density every one, every, about every two to three years after menopause. Thank you. Let's see, now is a good time to talk about questions. Whoop, there we go. And um, we did have one in the uh, chat and then we'll open it up to um, live Q&A. Um, do older lesbian women without previous problems need pelvic exams and pap smears? That is a fantastic question. So women that may have never had any type of activity there still are at risk for human papillovirus. Even though they've never had intercourse or any type of activity in the vagina, if they even had touching, because HPV human papillovirus can be spread from skin to skin contact. You can actually have HPV, there's about 60 strains of HPV on your skin, on your fingers, and through close contact of genital to genital or just touching, you could have a transmission of HPV and or, so cervical pap smear testing is indicated because of that reason. And a pelvic exam, this is a part of your body where it's an anatomical body part that needs to be examined just like your leg or your arm or your ears or your nose. You need to have your pelvic exam done to check your palpation of your ovaries, your cervix, your uterus, and a rectal exam. Great question. All right, a follow-up question, um, completely separate, but what kind of in health insurance does Eisenhower take and um, one thing before Carrie answers that, she'll have a better sense of maybe some of that, but um, you can always go to eisenhowerhealth.org and on our main page in the search bar, just put in insurance. It lists a breakout of all of our insurance that we take currently, but um, there's also a phone number there for you to call and discuss your own specific insurance plan directly with a care person who will be able to advise you correctly. But from Carrie, your perspective, if somebody, how does that work? That's a great answer, Brett. I think it's best if you call. Um, 
Eisenhower takes most insurances. There's some HMOs that we need referrals and so forth. So just check with your provider, usually primary care providers. If you have an HMO, they ask you to see there's certain primary care providers, but they will refer you to specialists here, even from those uh, types of insurance. I would encourage you just to check with your own insurance and call the number that Brett suggested to find out the finer details for you specifically. Thank you for asking that question. Yeah, another great question, which comes up on every single call or <laughs> presentation lately. I need to find a primary care doctor. How do I find one? That's a great question. Everybody's looking for a primary doctor. Once again, you can go to our Eisenhower website and there are resources there. And also we have this wonderful program called the 365 program, which allows for individuals to call and be connected with a 365 provider, which has a smaller panel and can give you a little bit more individual um, attention. So if you're interested in that program, please call the Eisenhower main line and they'll connect you with a 365 coordinator who will connect you with a physician. Perfect answer. Um, and that's what we're finding nationally and especially in California and especially in Palm Springs right now is primary care physicians are um, hard to come by. We have a lot of people in the prospect list that may be joining and that's um, both with Eisenhower and many other um, facilities locally. So. It's just a matter of being patient. Um, but we also have our residency clinic. So one thing is if you don't need a specialist perhaps, and if you're looking for primary care, you can go to our, um, our internal medicine residency clinic in Cathedral City right there at the um, Target parking area. And uh, you can also go to our family medicine um, residency clinic in um, La Quinta at the Arduous Center on Washington. And either one of those, um, in most cases, you can get to see a physician much faster and you'll have a care team. They are medical providers. They are just in residency program of the first, second or third year of, of specialty training. Is that correct, Carrie? Yes, it is. Absolutely. Okay. Our residents are fantastic. They usually have a little more availability and they are really wonderful. Perfect. Another question just came in. You give starting age for all these tests, but do you continue forever? What about someone in their 90s? I'd say if you're healthy and you want to remain healthy, no matter what age you are, 90, 95, have screening tests because it can catch ailments earlier and can you could live to 119 like that lovely lady in Japan right? So I'm all for screening tests. And then you can screen, find something. And then if you decide not to treat it for various reasons, you have that choice, but you have the knowledge to make that decision. Great. Someone in the chat corrected. I think that woman before she died had a birthday because they said 120. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, 120, even better. Yes, that's fantastic. Before she passed. <laughs> fantastic. I think it's possible. I predict that, uh, you know, everybody is going to start living longer and longer because of advancements in technology and early screening. All right. Let's open it up for live questions from the audience. Please awesome. feel Feel free to unmute yourself um, and take your video off if you like. I have Carrie able to see everybody as well. Yes, so um, please ask a question. Let's just be respectful of each other. If there is a reaction button at the bottom, if you'd like that where you can raise your hand and that way we can kind of yes. uh, see. I'll raise mine so that you can see. Oh, there's my little hand. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so you can hit the reaction button or just chime in if you do have a, a question. We do have another question in the chat. We'll just to start us off. I said, I have relied on Eisenhower for primary care for over a decade. Given the current post-pandemic environment, is virtual appointments now part of the long-term options um, for connecting with one's PCP, um, primary care provider? Great question. I do believe it's still an option. You can just request it. I think oftentimes for a first visit, they may want to see you in person. 
but subsequently you could have FaceTime visits. More questions for Carrie, because I do have one, if not, I, Carrie, can you talk a little bit more about your new world of HRAs and, yes. and those who have who've tuned in with the center have participated with you and, and John Colbert and talk to us about what this means, because I was, it was eye opening for me to understand because I've had them done for myself as a male, mm -hmm. but I did not understand all the nuances for women. Absolutely. Thank you for asking. So it's still an emerging science. Uh, I work at the high resolution clinic here at Eisenhower Health, where we see men and women. What we do is we see men and women that are identifying as having HPV on an anal pap and or we are doing some anal paps for providers that don't do them as well, where the provider identifies risk factors for anal rectal cancer within this man or woman. And if we, when we do the anal pap, if it comes back positive for HPV and or abnormal cells, then the next step is to do a high resolution anoscopy where I examine the external and internal tissue of the anal rectal anatomy looking for any precancerous lesions and doing small biopsies about the size of a half a grain of rice if I do see an abnormal tissue sending that tissue to a pathologist, the pathologist sending me the results in 10 days and identifying if it's a precancerous lesion, grading the lesion one, two, or three. If it's a two or three, I have that patient come back and I hyperkate it, treat it with electrocautery. If it's an AIN1, I watch it. If it's wart, which doesn't lead to cancer, but can be a nuisance because they tend to grow, I will treat it with electrocautery as well. If it's something such as an early cancer, then we see have you see a colorectal surgeon. But for men that are exposed to HPV or known that they've had genital warts, um, they are candidates to have that screening done every year. Uh, because of risk factors, because of MSM and or being positive, HIV positive does increase the risk as well. So that puts them in a different stratification. But really anybody, male, female, gay, straight, should really consider talking to the primary care provider about any risk factors they may have that indicates they need to have what's called an anal pap, where we check for HPV and any abnormal cells because I can find with somebody with those risk factors, potentially early precancerous lesions, identify it through a biopsy and treat it before it turns into cancer. So it's a very big proactive step that's very empowering for patients. So I really encourage all of you to talk to your primary care provider, say I've heard this anal pap, Male, female, doesn't matter. HPV, human papillovirus, is the most prevalent STD on the planet. No matter if you're male, female, gay, straight, doesn't matter. They estimate that out of every three sexually active adults, so adults over the age of 18, out of every three, one of those three has HPV. There are about 60 strains of HPV. We know of three strains that are linked to an increased risk doesn't mean you're gonna have it, but increased risk for anorectal cancer. And we have the tools to test for that. So why not get tested if you fall into a category where you may be at risk for this? That's great, great question. Thank you so much for asking, Brett. Great information, thank you. Anybody have any questions regarding anal paps or HPV? That is my area of specialty at this time. And it's not specifically sexual in nature. Correct. Correct, right? HPV virus, it's very smart. And you could have never, ever have had any sexual activity in the anus whatsoever. Once again, male, female, gay, straight, doesn't matter. The virus is from skin to skin contact. And the virus itself has an affinity for certain types of tissue type. And it can just migrate. You could have had a wart on your belly button. And theoretically, HPV can find its way to your anal tissue because it likes a certain type of tissue within the anal canal called squamous columnar junction tissue. It, that tissue is also found in the cervix, the vagina, the vulvar tissue, which is outside of the vagina, 
some head and neck tissues and esophageal. And that virus can find its way to those tissues without a lot of help. Also, if you have any symptoms around the anus, male or female, talk to your provider about that and see if you should have an anal pap. Fantastic. And just to clarify, an anal pap is not the same as a colonoscopy. Correct. And HPV actually isn't a risk factor for colon cancer. It doesn't have an affinity, doesn't care about colon tissue. So HPV is not a risk factor for colon cancer, but it is a risk factor for anal rectal cancer. When you have a colonoscopy, your gastroenterologist is looking at your anal rectal canal as it passes through it, through a, col through a colon, the colonoscopy scope, but they're using their naked eye. It doesn't have much magnification. When you come and have a high resolution anoscopy, if you have an abnormal pap smear, I'm looking through a microscope through the an anal scope to the anal tissue with a five time magnification. So I can see tissue nuances and early lesions before they develop and before they're only, they are picked up by the naked eye through a colonoscopy. Colonoscopy can pick up anal rectal lesions, but I can pick them up sooner if I have the heads up that you have a positive anal pap or symptoms or risk factors, then I can hopefully catch it before it's to the point to where you're seeing it now with the naked eye by having a colonoscopy. Well, thanks so much, Carrie. I want to give a quick little shout out to the Center's Behavioral Health Clinic for participating tonight. We see a lot of our, our folks from our behavioral health clinic on this one. Uh, their boss is out of town, so I'm guessing this is, <laughs> this is a great topic for them to do instead of their supervision, because their supervision's on the same day, so they don't get the benefit of being able to attend these. So Thank all of you for attending and we're glad to see you and thanks so much. Thank you so much. You've been a wonderful audience. You all have bright faces and I wish you health and wellness. I wish you all a wonderful rest of 2022 and thank you so much for attending and I really appreciate all of your time. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carrie. Thanks everyone. Bye everybody. Thank you.